Okay, first off, apologies that we haven't uh, been doing this in a couple of weeks. We've all been very busy with work and uh, doing interesting stuff and going on holiday ourselves. Yeah, November's been something of a uh, busy month for both of us. And speaking of holidays, and seeing as how uh, Thunderbirds was a very uh, British show, and how we loved to see uh, Anderson throwing in as many British cliches, it looks as if he had that one episode where he just threw everything together and pulled out all the stops with Lord Parker's holiday. <laughs> Now this one follows Lady Penelope and Parker venturing on holiday, as the title would suggest, to Monte Blanco, which we assume is like a small Italian town. Now what makes this town particularly interesting is it's apparently the first town to be powered completely by solar energy. So it looks like Anderson was predicting a lot of the future. I mean, there's a great deal of solar energy today, so it looks like this was another one. I guess he wasn't so sure about solar panels, so instead he had this idea of a huge sort of like satellite dish that uh, is placed upon the top of this mountain, aboard, uh, just above this small town, and it uh, seems to be taking in a lot of the uh, solar power, and you said it was kind of like something uh, Dr. Octopus uses in Spider-Man. <laughs> it reminded me, the harnessing the power of the sun it reminded me very much of um, Doc Ock in Spider-Man 2, except in uh, Spider-Man 2, obviously, it's a massive fusion reaction where he makes a massive sun. Well, a little sun, I guess, in perspective. But yeah, this one involves um, basically taking the solar rays using a giant satellite dish about like, weighing something like 4,000 pounds or yeah, I don't it was know, 400 tons or something. 400 tons. Big massive satellite dish that essentially reflects the sun, absorbs the sunlight and um, yeah, converts it into electricity. Enough to run this entire little town. So well, when the Penelope and Parker arrive there, uh, the town is actually in the middle of a, of a giant storm which causes uh, Parker to uh, uh, ruin uh, his uh, summer, summer attire. So instead they have a nice little uh, a nice, a nice little uh, fancy dress night. It seems they've turned up in a fancy dress night where everyone gets dressed up as uh, Marie Antoinette and uh, the French aristocracy from the 18th century. Yeah, a lot of old-fashioned but highly fashionable aristocratic clothing. It's a strange fancy dress pie, but during said storm, um, obviously a great disaster happens, as is predicted by uh, Bruno, the Can very I... pessimistic waiter, whose only catchphrase seems to be, it will be a great disaster. <laughs> It will be a great disaster. A kind of depressed man well, if you're familiar with Faulty Towers. Yes, a lot, like, a lot of Faulty Towers vibes from this episode. Yes, but yes. disaster does strike quite literally when a massive lightning storm takes the um, reflector out of action. And not only does it cause the tower to collapse, but it causes the reflector to fall in such a way so that when the sun rises the next morning, it will reflect off the reflector and act as a magnifying glass on the town, setting the entire place on fire. And Lady Penelope recognises this quite early on, and she decides to phone up Jeff and let him know what's going on. But it seems that uh, before that, uh, everyone just seems to enjoy the moonlight, so it's reflecting the moon down onto the uh, sleepy little town where everyone's sitting outside enjoying it, so I guess there would have been a lot of moonlight shadows. Thanks a lot, Mike Goldfield. <laughs> but anyways, and then we have probably the most amazing, uh, amazing call of interna for International Rescue's help in the entire series. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, now, on the way, on their way to uh, Monte Blanco, um, Lady Penelope and Parker notice while trying to listen to music that there's a lot of interference through the mountains. So Lady Penelope counters this by taking the car out to sea, and on her way she drives past. Basically, much like in one of the James Bond films, I think it's The Spy Who Loved Me. Yeah, where the car becomes like an amphibious landing craft or a submarine. Yeah, it? Fab One turns into yeah an amphibious craft. And um, she drives past, drives, sails, whatever, drives past this um, expensive yacht where an English bureaucrat is um, drinking away. And he happens to notice this um, bright pink Rolls Royce floating along, being driven by a woman dressed as Marie Antoinette. I've heard of pink elephants, but a pink Rolls Royce out of the sea, driven by Marie Antoinette, is ridiculous. But anyway, then we got International Rescue coming along, and we've got the, the assistance of Brains this mm -hmm. time. Brains takes um, quite, you know, probably the most involvement in the entire rescue. It's him who's um, lowered down to kind of fix the... Um, not Actually, no, not necessarily fix the uh, reflector, but point it skyward so it's, not mag so it's not pointed on the town anymore. And he does take quite a few, um, I wouldn't say unnecessary risks, but, um, you know, so that he can move around a lot, he takes the harness off, which Thunderbird 2 used to lower him down, much to Virgil's annoyance. Virgil's there saying, don't take any unnecessary risks, but Brains pretty much disregards any rules, which is kind of out of character 
for him, I guess. He seems a bit of a maverick. I guess the only rules he really follows are like the rules of physics or the rules of chemistry or something. Mm. And he, um, you know, he listens to Jeff Tracy more often than not, so maybe he just disregards the rules of the much younger sons. Maybe, but I mean, I'm guessing he's probably about the same age or so, but uh, you never really know. I mean, I think it was like, as I mentioned in my one or two books, that he was like the same age as, I think, Scott or something, but you never know. But then again, you've got uh, you've got Parker uh, pulling off probably the best way to distract the people from uh, from panicking if they realise that the whole place is about to go up in smoke. And so you've got him posing as Lord Parker, <laughs> as the title suggests, and his use of... Uh, his fakery of being part of the aristocracy seems to really ignite the people's interest, kind of quite similar to Basil Fawlty in the first episode of Fawlty Towers. Yeah, precisely. And so he decides to distract them with probably the most ingenious use of a classical, uh, very classical sort of like pastime in this country, something we usually associate with old ladies really, but uh, no, quite a few people still play it today, and it's bingo! <laughs> Lord Parker's bingo. In order to keep the guests occupied and in the hotel, should they need to extinguish any fires caused by the reflector, under the guise of Lord Parker, Parker holds a massive bingo game to ignite their interests. And yeah, being disguised as a lord, I think, helps him to um, mm. generate interest. And he generates uh, the odd pun every now and again about the place going up in flames. Mm. I think it's. Um, I think Parker always wanted to be a lord deep down at heart. You know, he's there serving Lady Penelope 24-7. Obviously, she treats him with a great deal of respect. But I think he aspires to the lifestyle that Lady Penelope does live. Yeah, and he seems to try and culture himself in this one, because you see him eating spaghetti, but he doesn't know how to do it, so uh, Penelope has said to him, Oh, Twisted Parker, around the fork. <laughs> and we were like saying, it's not stew now, you know, your bastard's not here to serve you. <laughs> it just seems quite abnormal that Parker shouldn't know how to eat spaghetti. It's all he eats. The bastard of Crichton Ward's stews. Maybe. I mean, he probably thinks it's all muck anyway, because it's all pompous stuff. But oh, you know, yeah. he might, he muck, might... muck. You might, you might aspire to be part of the upper class, you never know. Mm. But then again, uh, then you've got, um, so you've got Virgil and Alan are pretty much trying to uh, get the reflector out of the way, but it seems like the sun is about to uh, fry the top of the, uh, the hotel, so we find that the brains has fitted a very interesting little contraption into Thunderbird 1 that Scott used to blot out the sun. Yeah, it's a smoke screen, essentially. Um, it's obviously the episode, like many of the episodes, is a massive race against time. They're literally racing mm. against the sun. And um, they come up with an idea to buy them more time by getting a Thunderbird one to use the smoke screen to block out the sun so that it's no longer shining on the reflector, giving Brains just enough time to loosen the cogs and get Thunderbird 2 to reposition it. And then you have what uh, I think we would all have thought to be the sudden downfall of Brains, mm. as we just see the poor soul falling to his depths down the long rocky slope. Being brutally crushed by God knows how many boulders, you know, that suit gets absolutely obliterated. But fortunately, the twist proves to be wrong. Quite obvious, to be honest. But um, yeah, Brains is, brains is fine. He just, dis he just discarded yeah. the suit so they could move around even more. What a twist. What a twist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then again, you know, he gets lectured by, uh, by Virgil. And so he says, get that safety harness back on now and back in the ship now. <laughs> Well, I guess, uh, I guess even he has his little vices and everything. I mean, he even says at the end when, uh, when talking to Jeff, and Jeff says, you guys are going to be home for breakfast, it's 2 a.m., I'm going to bed. And he says, God, I still, it still baffles me, the differences in time across <laughs> the world. I think this episode served, like, on a secondary level, to educate kids about time differences yes. on the globe. You know, the, uh, there's a moment where Jeff and Grandma are watching the sunset, and he does make a point to say, well, on the other side of the world, it will be rising on Monte Blanco. So, you know, I think for a lot of kids, that might have been their introduction to different time zones. I would say so. I mean, I, I just learned uh, through one or two like kids' shows about it shining on the other side of the world, so... Mm. All we've got to do now is like, look at a map on the, on like, the internet or something, we've got all that. But yeah, this was a, would have been a good PSA for learning about geography, I guess. Yeah, especially back in the 60s. Even though it's never quite specified which country Monte Blanco is. I mean, is it Italy or is it Spain? Our, our impression was kind of like Italy. Yeah, Spain. I got the sense that it was Italy. Um, there's a moment where he's counting down in numbers, and um, they don't sound Spanish, so no. uh, my only other guess would be Italy. Well, it's, uh, Italian and Spanish are quite similar, but uh, you never know. Hmm. But yeah, this was a very fun episode. It had all the uh, all the like English cliches that we loved, and mm. you know, just made us remember the show very much. And there's a very interesting, a very interesting uh, kind of like fashion cameo at the end where uh, Parker has got dressed up ready to go to the beach, and he's wearing this 19th century swimsuit. Yeah, one of those old-fashioned swimsuits with like the white and blue stripes. You know, the kind of thing that. 
It's just, you ever look back on some of the fashions of like yesteryear and how, you know, just ridiculous they seem? It, it does make me wonder, seriously, in a few decades' time, may, you know, a few, several years' time, maybe 70 years or so, are people going to look back on some of the fashion choices that we've made, like, you know, that dreaded knot top or whatever it's called, yeah. and think, Jesus Christ, what were they? I mean, even today we're thinking, Jesus Christ, what are they thinking? Well, but... it, looks like, it looks like, yeah... It looks like Anderson had a very interesting taste in fashion, and he made, like, fashion stories, because we've had a few fashion-related stories already, so... Mm. But no, it's a good episode. The ones that focus on Lady Penelope and Parker always are. And I guess this was, like, an episode they may have shown during the summer holidays, I guess, because, you know, if it's a kid's show, there may as well be one episode that focuses on going away on holiday to a foreign land with your parents, enjoying the place on the beach. Yeah. You're on holiday? Parker's on holiday as well. Check him out. <laughs> but no, a really good episode. So um, stick around. The next episode we'll be taking our um, taking our eye to the sky in space with um, space radio pirates. Oh uh, yes, yes. It's like the, uh, the pirate radios in the sixties or something. But perhaps we're going to be in space. So we'll see you next time when we're flying away from the birds. F A B. F A B.